As we mentioned at the beginning of the series, the teachings of the Buddha are vast in scope and profound in their implications. Among the most profound are his teachings on Tantra, also called Vajrayana, based on a foundation of loving kindness, a correct view of reality, and total renunciation. You're tired of life, as you've known it, and you're courageously determined to be free of samsara for the sake of all beings. If that's the case, then the practice of Tantra is for you. Under the guidance of qualified masters, students learn methods such as visualization, deity yoga meditation, and mantra recitation that help transform diluted energy into wisdom so we can see the totality of who and what we really are. As Buddhist practitioners, it's essential to realize that the highly sophisticated and sensitive techniques in Tantra simply won't work and even can be highly dangerous unless our motivation is genuinely altruistic. Since these precious teachings are extremely difficult to come across in this day and age, join us in investigating how we can make the most of this extremely rare opportunity. In this presentation, you're going to hear about the Buddha's most esoteric teachings, those of Tantra. You've also heard that an altruistic motivation is especially important in the case of these teachings. In fact, it's very much like in the fairy tales you may have heard as a child. You know, it's only the most pure-hearted hero who's actually able to free the princess and save the day. And in the same way, it's only the most sincere, altruistic-minded practitioner who is able to succeed in the practice of Tantra. Now, the Buddha said that the fundamental nature of our hearts and minds is purity. We simply have to discover that purity through the veils of our ignorance. And so before listening to these teachings, take just a moment to discover the purity of your own heart and to generate a very strong and determined intention to attain the state of a Buddha through the practice of Tantra in order to be able to bring to enlightenment all other living beings. We can correct our the uh, the attitude. We can correct our action. Don't think that uh, my attitude, my action is you know my previous karma. I cannot do anything. That is a misunderstanding of karma. Don't think I'm the powerless. We do have power, human being. We do have power to change our lifestyle, to change our attitude, to change our habit. That capacity you call, maybe Buddha potentiality or God potentiality or whatever you call. That's why Buddhism is simple, simple. And it is a universal teaching. It is understandable for any religions or non-religious people. That is the beauty of human being has a powerful instrument any kind of things we can trick, any energy we can trick, we can transform in something else. Oh, oh, that's why Tibetan Buddhism has much method how to transform attachment into the path to liberation, how to desire transform it, path to liberation. We do have much emphasis, you know, method. The Buddhist point of view, there is no human problem which is cannot solved by human being. 
and that that personally to to understand and to encourage that the entire my problem I can deal with my problem I can solve my problem that attitude is I think a very essential for the growth of oneself I truly believe that all of us you know even though we are not good meditators you know we are not maybe good spiritual you know but all of us if we have you know some understanding and we have encouragement one self we can solve the problem most time we lack of you know understanding of our own capacity we put ourselves down that's why tibetan buddhism sometimes you see buddha with you you see yourself as buddha i'm sure you all of you heard that kind of thing the Tibetan tradition of, of Buddhism, um, there is a great emphasis on practicing Tantra as the fastest way to achieve enlightenment. Not just to get enlightened quickly, but the reason that the Buddha taught Tantra is, was originally it was taught to bodhisattvas, great bodhisattvas who had unbearable compassion for the suffering of sentient beings. And because of that, found it unbearable that it takes three countless great eons to achieve enlightenment. And that while one is becoming a Buddha, sentient beings are suffering all that time. So because of that, the Buddha taught the fast way to achieve enlightenment, the tantric way. So it's meant for bodhisattvas, those beings who have unbearable compassion so all of Tibetan Buddhism is influenced by the Tantric view. And um, from a Tantric point of view, the, 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 the teacher, the qualified teacher, is the very embodiment of the triple gem of the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. So it's kind of appropriate to think about this, this subject in the sense of meeting with a, a qualified teacher and generating the right uh, relationship to that teacher is a very crucial part of the path to liberation and enlightenment. We need someone who really n not simply knows the words of the Dharma but knows their own mind and has, no has the experience of controlling their mind in a wise and skillful way. And not just a little bit but the more we want to accomplish the more qualified the teacher we need. If we want to accomplish a little bit, a bit with our mind, we only need a teacher who has a little bit of accomplishment. But if we want to achieve enlightenment, we need someone very, very highly qualified. A Buddha, <laughs> maybe. For someone who is teaching uh, the, uh, the path to enlightenment through Tantra, then there is a whole set of um, other qualities that the guru needs. So when in devoting us in, in deciding to follow a particular teacher, we should take time to check the qualities of the teacher, try to see if they have these qualities. Uh, a, a real guru is something like an iceberg. An iceberg, uh, only one tenth of the ice of an iceberg appears above the water nine-tenths is below the water. 
So a guru is like that. When we see great beings, we can see many qualities. Even at our level, we can see qualities. What we should try to understand is that that's just a little hint of the actual qualities of a truly realized being. For practicing Dharma, basically one has a choice of sutric practices or tantric practices. Within the sutric practices, there is the Lam Rim, presented traditionally within the three scopes. It addresses individuals of the small scope, the middle scope, and those of the great scope. Another way to summarize the three scopes of the Lam Rim is to present the three principal aspects of the path. One of our prayers says, May I be able to generate renunciation, bodhicitta, and correct view, and may I be able to complete the two stages of Tantra. So you see straight away in the first line we have mention of the three principal aspects of the path. Then in the second line there is reference to Tantric practices. When we talk about Sutric practices, or the sutric vehicle. We call that also the causal vehicle. When we are talking about the tantric practices, we can refer to them as the resultant vehicle. The reason why we call the sutric vehicle the causal one is because what we are stressing is the causes that will bring about the ultimate result. And here, when we talk about causes, we are talking about engaging into the practices of the six perfections. So things such as generosity and ethics and enthusiastic effort and concentration and wisdom and patience. So in the six of them, they actually include method and wisdom, which are the causes that will bring about the result that we are seeking. Now in Tantra, we are stressing different things and this is why the name resultant vehicle is used. It is called the resultant vehicle because the way we practice is in a way that is stressing the result. Straight from the beginning, we are looking at the resultant state of enlightenment and we set that as being our ultimate goal. What we do through practices of data yoga is we try to imitate, we try to visualize, we try to imagine that we have already reached that state and we are practicing. In a sense, we are rehearsing the activities that we would be doing if we were already enlightened. We have four different classes of Tantra. We have action, performance, yoga, and highest yoga tantra. At each one of those classes of tantra, when they are presented, they are presented more or less in four different chapters. The first chapter would be the chapter of empowerment. The second one would be of the vows and commitments that are assumed. The third one is the path that is meditated upon. And the last one would be the presentation of the result that is attained. So we start first with the empowerment, which is the step that opens up the door for the tantric path. In the same way that you enter the house through the door, you enter the tantric path through going through the process of ceremony. And what the ceremony does for you, it authorizes you to be able to listen, to reflect, and to meditate on the various tantric teachings. It's important to make the distinction of different ways of attending a ceremony of empowerment there will be some people who will be coming and receiving it merely as a blessing. But there are others who will take it as a proper empowerment. Now, what makes the difference? What do we mean by making the distinction between these two? If you think that you are not capable of keeping all the vows and commitments that will follow by taking the empowerment, if you feel that you are not ready to meditate on this path, if you feel that you are not ready to visualize yourself as the deity, then it's best not to take this empowerment you will still be present at the time of ceremony and receive the whole thing as a blessing. On the other hand, if you decide that you are ready to take these vows and commitments and you are ready to engage in those practices, then you actually request and you will receive the empowerment. And then, of course, you have the obligation of keeping up with the vows and commitments and, of course, your daily practices. 
So for action and performance tantra, first of all, the first levels of vows that are assumed by those who are lay people are vows of individual liberation, and these are in the form of the vows of refuge. So these include abandoning the ten non-virtuous actions. Then on top of that, the vows which are assumed are bodhisattva vows. In the case of action and performance tantra, we are not receiving tantric vows. In the case of yoga and highest yoga tantra, on top of refuge and on top of bodhisattva vows, we also assume the tantric vows. Together with the tantric vows, we assume the commitment of engaging in six session guru yoga. Now, as the name indicates, there are six sessions of that. It's a practice that is repeated six times during the day, every day. If one is practicing lower tantras, one would have to engage in two distinct stages, which are called yoga with signs and yoga without signs. Within the frame of the practices with signs, what we are doing is we are generating ourselves as the deity, visualizing the deity with all its aspects. Then at the next phase, when we are practicing yoga without signs, we are meditating on the emptiness of all these appearances. What happens with the highest yoga tantra is that we are engaging in practices of generation stage and practices of completion stage. Again, there are two distinct phases, more or less similar practices, but they are given different names. At the stage of generation, again, we are visualizing ourselves as the deity, but at the stage of completion, we are focusing on practices that will be bringing about the purification of the channels, the winds, and the drops. The reason why we do that is because we want to render the three things serviceable. We want to bring about a certain degree of purification and flexibility with the winds and the drops that move within our channels. And the reason for that is that in that way we can actually bring about a general purification of all other aspects of our body, not only improving the health, but also getting closer to this model of perfect existence of the Buddha that we have as a goal. So what we are trying to do in the practice of completion stage is to purify the channels and the winds that flow through them. If we can render those things serviceable, then what we will do is actually, ideally, purify the winds that move through the channels. And if you can change the movement of the winds, that means that you can also change the type of mind that is riding those winds. This is what we are referring to when we use the term completion. We are referring to complete purification and complete serviceability of the winds and the channels. Now, it is important to understand that most of the channels that we have within our own body are not stretched out as they should be. Most of the channels are twisted. Many of them may have knots in them, which means that channels which are restricted like that do not allow a flow of the winds and the substances through them. So it's important to exercise. In the same way that some people like very much to do physical exercise because they know the benefit of those exercises. If you can understand that on a physical level, then take that at the level of completion stage and understand that what you are doing during your daily yoga is to engage in some sort of exercises that will bring about this pliancy of the channels and the winds and the substances. Now, when we talk about Tantra, also we use the word mantra and many times we also talk about secret mantra. Mantra and Tantra are used almost as an equivalent. If we look at the etymology of the word mantra, it can be broken down into two words. It means mind protection. And when we talk about those practices, we talk about protection and it's not only the body and speech that need to be protected. The mind is the one that primarily needs to be protected. If the mind is protected, then the body and speech will automatically, secondarily in a sense, will also be covered by this protection. And what is it that the mind needs to be to protected from? Well, it is the sense that we have an ordinary body, an ordinary speech, an ordinary mind. We need to protect ourselves from thinking that we are ordinary. We need to protect ourselves from ordinary appearances and a sensing at those appearances. So this is the protection that we are seeking for through these practices. And finally, we come to the explanation of the last word, secret. When we talk about the mantra or tantra, we mean the secret vehicle. It's called the secret vehicle because those practices need to remain undisclosed. Undisclosed to those who are not suitable to hear about those things. It is said that if you talk about your tantric practices to those who are not ready or are not suitable, they have not been prepared to hear about those things, most probably these people will generate reverse faith, 
non-faith in those practices, and this is what we are trying to avoid in this situation. As beginners, it makes more sense that we will spend more time on practices of sutra rather than practices of tantra, but that doesn't mean that we will completely abandon tantric practices. It is important to understand that sutra on its own cannot take you very far, and tantra that is not supported by sutra will not end with the right result. So it's important to always unite sutra and tantra and make sure that one complements the other. Tantra is often uh, presented as something that's afterwards. It's something that's more advanced. In other words, first we study the uh, the sutra path, what the Tibetans would call the Lam Rim, the graded stages of the path, and um, develop uh, certain basic fundamentals, such as um, what Lama Tsongkhapa called the uh, three principal aspects of the path, the um, renunciation, the, the, the wish and the determination to break free from uh, suffering and limitation, and then um, uh, the view of emptiness, you know, understanding the true nature of reality, and bodhicitta, developing the warm heart, the dedicated heart, striving for enlightenment to benefit others. So that, in a sense, summarizes the sutra path. So it isn't as if we, we practice on a sutra level until we're proficient and then we turn to something else it's that the practice of Tantra allows us to get into those very same areas on a deeper, more meaningful basis. And so, um, for me, uh, Lama Yeshe's introduction to Tantra, um, it really comes alive for me in a really meaningful way, not so much when it's talking about Tantra itself, but rather uh, the three principal aspects that give it birth, that give it meaning. Um, many years ago, um, in the middle of the 70s, so quite a long time before I was working on this book, I did a retreat on Vajrasattva. That's the purification practice, which is considered a very um, important preliminary and, and aspect of, of, of tantric practice. When it was over, and I had to think back as to what the retreat really was about, it really was about um, renunciation. Even though I was doing tantric practices and tantric visualizations and so forth, what the retreat actually taught me to some extent was um, the ordinary way that I live my life, the ordinary ego-dominated way that I live my life is just totally unsatisfactory even when things look beautiful, uh, look pleasant. They may just be, it might just, just be a disguised form of dissatisfaction and suffering. I don't think the reality of that would have hit me if, at the same time, I wasn't doing other practices which were attempting to kind of purify my vision, concentrate my attention. Um, remove some major obstacles so that I, I could understand things on a deeper level. So later, when, when I was working on Lama Yeshe's teachings on Introduction to Tantra, where, he, where he, he discusses this to some extent, you know, that Tantra helps you actually understand the sutra topics better, I, I, really, I really felt I understood what, what he meant, what he was pointing at.